Welcome everyone, and thank you so much for coming to be part of this capacity crowd for this special edition of the 2023 Fishtails Lecture Series. My name is Mark Holy, the organizer of the Fishtails, and tonight we're honored to have with us a nationally recognized Wisconsin author, Dan Egan, to chat with us about his most recent book, The Devil's Element, Phosphorus in a World Out of Balance. The Fishtail series, our lecture series, is an educational outreach program of the Crossroads at Big Creek uh, in partnership with the Door County Library to present the science of Great Lakes fisheries. For tonight's lecture, we are thankful for the support of three additional sponsors right on Door County, the Peninsula Pulse, and Healthy Waters Door County. The board and staff at Crossroads acknowledge the First Nations people who are the original inhabitants of this region um, having ancient historical and spiritual connections to the land of our preserves that they now encompass and the land and water that they now steward. In addition to being the largest fish tails event ever, today was an important traditional day here at Crossroads at Big Creek. It was Samantha Coyan's first day as the new executive director. And it's my pleasure to ask Sam to come down and introduce herself. Those are a lot of stairs. <laughs> so I wanted to say, hi. <laughs> um, and I'd also like to acknowledge the incredible staff here at Crossroads. Uh, they make events like this possible. Uh, I know uh, I saw there's Laurel, uh, Corey, I'm sure, up oh, there, Corey, and Coggin. I apparently can't see anything. Oh, she's down below. Um, additionally, I'd also be remiss if I didn't mention any of the board members, and I have to say, this is my first day, so I'm sorry if I don't recognize any of you. <laughs> um, thank you all f um, for your dedication to Crossroads and the Door County community. As Mark shared, I'm Samantha Coyne, the new executive director here at Crossroads as of today, so I've only been here for like 10 hours. Um, way back before I knew of Door County, one of the very first conversations I had with my now current husband, Jesse, was had I ever heard of the book, Life and Death of the Great Lakes. Or Death and Life, sorry. <laughs> and if I had ever heard of the author, Dan Egan. Jesse proceeded to brag about his father, Kenny Coyne, and how he's mentioned in Dan's book, which was a two-time finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. Little did I know that I'd have the privilege, seven years later, living in Door County and experiencing Door County, marrying the man who so emphatically talked about Dan's book, and have the complete serendipitous experience of inter introducing the author, who is a topic of conversation on the first day I met my husband, and now is the speaker on the first day of my new job. <laughs> <laughs> Dan's contributions to the field of conservation and scientific literacy has always struck a chord with myself and many of the people of Door County. We are profoundly lucky to have him here with us tonight, sharing his latest book, The Devil's Element. Thank you. Past fish lecture, Fishtails lectures have focused on a number of the Great Lakes fishery issues that Dan presented in his acclaimed book, The Death and Life of the Great Lakes. Thanks to the Door County Library, we have a playlist of all our previously recorded um, lectures. And if you didn't get one on the way in, be sure to look for it on your way out, uh, because they all are very informative. Tonight, we will have a conversation about the 15th element of the periodic table of elements, namely phosphorus. I would like to introduce Miles Danheisen, Jr., uh, representing Right on Door County and the Peninsula Pulse, who will add a journalistic perspective to the question and answer program we will have with Dan, followed by questions from the audience, and then to finish the evening off, Dan will be available to sign your book of The, uh, the Devil's Element, a copy that you can purchase here tonight from Novel Bay Booksellers. Dan Egan is presently the Brico Fund Journalist in Residence at the Center for Water Policy in the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee's School of Freshwater Sciences. Dan is a graduate of the University of Michigan and the Columbia School of Journalism. He was a reporter covering Great Lakes issues for the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel for 19 years from 2002 to 2021. He, was, he has twice been a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize 
and has won numerous awards for his journalism, including the coveted Alfred I. DuPont Columbia University Award, considered one of the most prestigious awards in journalism. Finally, in addition to his journalism pedigree, I also want to acknowledge that Dan is the son of our beloved Clark Lake residents, Dick and Ann Egan. <laughs> So, to get things started, um, after writing The Death and Life of the Great Lakes, which is very popular, what made you choose Phosphorus as your next book? Um, well, I, I had covered a, there was, is this the right level? I can't, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, in, the, in that Great Lakes book, I did a chapter on Lake Erie and focused a lot on phosphorus and what that was doing to the Lake Erie watershed. Specifically, it was... Wreaking havoc, with this, wreaking havoc with this toxic algae. And when the, the Great Lakes book came out in March of 2017, and I was busy for about six months doing things like this, and um, at, about, at about six months, the publisher, it was selling better than I think they expected it to, and they said, do you have any other ideas? And I suggested phosphorus, and he got a pretty blank stare. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, to be honest, I don't know if I, I could feel it on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> Pause, um, and they said, "Well, you know, send us send us a, a pitch. Why?" And I did, and so to to to, to convince a publisher to uh, publish that Great Lakes book, it I worked on the proposal for like a year and a half, and um, they kept you know saying, "Yeah, we like it, but we want more of this and more of that." And I spent almost as much time pitching it to them as I did writing it, and with this one, it was it was real quick. So uh, I think they saw the reason that it was book worthy, and um, that's that's what launched me on on this one. On this one, the Great Lakes book took me two hour, two years to write, but it was based on ten years of of reporting I had done for the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. This book took me probably two and a half or three years, but I had to do everything from scratch, most everything. So did you? Um, um do you have a vision of what the book on phosphorus is going to be? Because it, you know, I, after reading the death and the life of the Great Lakes, when I said they said you're going to write about phosphorus, I kind of thought, okay, you're going to focus in on the phosphorus issues in the Great Lakes and that kind of stuff. But this is a much broader, comprehensive view. Did you did you know how much it would take to put together when you started? Did you? Have well, a, yeah. I, I mean, I think I had an idea, and then I, I started finding things that were even more interesting. But what really kind of got me interested in, in, in doing a larger takeout on it was when I read how phosphorus was discovered in 1669 in Hamburg, Germany. It was a, there was an alchemist uh, chasing the philosopher's stone, which they thought at the time could, you know, convert base metals into precious metals like gold and silver. And the, the thought was all metals were evolving at the time, and if they could just find the substance that was causing this evolution, they could hurry it along. And so they were looking everywhere for this and this guy thought he could find it in the in the urine stream so he um he cooked he cooked his urine and did a bunch of hocus pocus there was a lot of urine and he, <laughs> and he got these uh these waxy nuggets that glowed in the dark that were phosphorescent um he didn't find them. it turned out that you know urine can't turn the only thing urine can turn gold is a snowbank <laughs> <laughs> But uh, it, was, it was just a curiosity for a while, and then, of course, it's very combustible, hence the name The Devil's Element, and it wasn't long before we were using it as a weapon and, uh, you know, eventually as a nutrient. So, so that's where I, I thought I would start the book, and I actually, I have a turkey fryer. I have a bunch of friends who drink beer. I have uh, safety goggles. And a thermometer. I thought I could. I thought I could make my own phosphorus. And I, at the time, I had a, a father-in-law, who was a chemical engineer, who spent his career working on catalysts to produce ammonia for fertilizer. So he was he was kind of in the know, and he was going to come up around Thanksgiving. And I had proposed it to him, and he laughed and said, "You know, well, well, it'll be fun trying." But then I got a hold of a, probably because we'd have to drink all the beer you know, to get the urn. But th then I got a hold of a. <laughs> I got a hold of a, a, a chemist who specializes in reproducing these old experiments, 
at Johns Hopkins University and I told him what I was thinking about and he said he had the same thought years earlier and to just don't. He said, one, it's gross, it's, it's a dirty enterprise, and two, it's super dangerous. The closer you get to success, the closer you get to blowing yourself up. So it's, there's some of that in the book, just a reference to it, but my grand plan was to open with a bang and... Uh, I yeah, and I, I was going to ask you that. I mean, you, you literally start with a pants on fire story, right? Oh, is it pan yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Where the so guy was yeah. put out of the Baltic or whatever. I was, I was constantly reminded that this was a book about phosphorus by the publisher and the agent, the editor as well. And, you know, we want stories. And, and that, it wasn't hard to convince me of that because that's what I've done at newspapers for so long. So yeah, I mean, I was always looking for interesting human connections. And the opening opening of the book is actually a guy in Florida in Cape Coral who was pulled over for drugs and he got out and he ran and he jumped into one of those canals that lace Cor Cape Coral like alleyways. And it was filled with this toxic algae and he almost drowned. The, the police weren't gonna jump in after him and they were yelling for him to get out and he was like dog paddling and vomiting and um, he ended up surviving but that was i thought a good way to open the book and then it goes on to the the first chapter. yeah the first chapter, the first chapter where it's back in hamburg germany so you know that's where this stuff was discovered and i mentioned earlier that it wasn't long before we started making weapons with it and uh <coughs> that came home in hamburg in a big way in 1943 when the allies burned the city to the ground with incendiary bombs many of which were phosphorus based so these bombs they look a lot like, like fireworks, those globules that just drift down, but they don't. And this I always wonder, when we're watching fireworks on the bay or whatever, where does all that stuff go? Yeah. I mean, it's fun to watch, but oh, I, we I don't have ask to that question. Right? Yeah, yeah, don't ask, don't ask. <laughs> well, in the case of uh, phosphorus bombs, it, 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 it congeals, and they're these little shards, and they sink, and they're stable and harmless but they look a lot like amber. And amber, unfortunately, is like very common up there in northern Germany and on the Baltic coast. And people comb the beaches collecting it. And it's, you can Google this. It doesn't happen every day or every week, but it happens several times a year, at least. Somebody thinks they find a nugget of amber and they put it in their pocket. And when it warms to a tick above 80 Fahrenheit, 85 maybe, it combusts. And so that's where I start the book with a guy who, he, he says he didn't think it was amber, he thought it was a fossilized oyster shell. And uh, didn't think much of it, put it in his pocket, it was a winter day, he was on the Baltic coast, not far from Hamburg, and uh, all of a sudden, and he's like, he had no idea what was going on, he's like, I don't smoke, I didn't have a lighter, why did my leg just burst into flames? And he put his hand in his pocket and he pulled it, there was just a goo down there, he pulled it out and all of his fingers were like birthday candles when he took them out. They're just on fire. Yeah, so he had to go into the, into the um, Baltic Sea in December or January and to put out the flames. But then when he would come back out, it would flare up again. And uh, they were going to bring in a helicopter, but uh, they thought it would take the helicopter down. So they ended up waiting for an ambulance and packing him in, in cold or wet uh, towels and getting him to an emergency room. and extracting it and uh, it, he survived but he burned like almost half of his body from that so yeah that was and so I, when I went there's, there's nothing funny about this but there's I'll just share it uh, so I'm walking on the beach with this guy and I have a translator with me who is she lives in, in Germany and uh, she was a friend of mine from graduate school and she was, you know, talking to him, and I started looking on the beach for amber or, or phosphorus. And I found one, and I brought it, and I was afraid to, like, have it in my hand, so I put it on my notebook, and I showed it to him while he's having a discussion with this woman. And he's like, yeah, yeah, it looked like that. And then I run around, and they're just talking, whatever they're talking about, and I bring another one back. <laughs> and he starts looking agitated, and he's like, yeah, like that. And she turns to me and just says, dude, <laughs> can you read his face? And it, it was painful for him. You know, it was scary. And it is scary. That's why it's, uh, it's in the book. And, you know, it's scary today because it's, it's believed to be being used in Ukraine and um, 
maybe some other places. And in the U.S., it's legal to use if you're going to primarily, if you're going to use it exclusively or mostly, I guess, as a smoke screen or to illuminate a night sky. But it's also just a real weapon of terror because when it hits, it burns right to the bone and there's no way to treat it in the field or anything like that. So, yeah. That's a, <laughs> well, that cheery, sounds great. Cheery yeah. stuff. Yeah. <laughs> um, but no, that was, it, was, it was important to just talk about what this stuff is because it doesn't exist on its own in nature. And we tinkered with it a lot. And along, with that along the way with that tinkering, we figured out that it was basically a miraculous nutrient that is a big reason why we have 9 billion people on the planet today. Um, yeah. So, did you well, Dan, I was going to ask you, as you know, writers, we are prone to doubt. And mm -hmm. you mentioned that this book, compared to your first book, you, they, they jumped on it right away. But in your process of writing it and researching it, uh, did you ever wonder, like, really a book about phosphorus? Is this going to, am I going to be able to finish this? Do I really have a book here? Oh, uh, no, I knew I had a book, but I did have like, you know, connecting the dots and making it kind of a, there, it took the, the architecture of that, if that maybe sounds too fancy, the organization of that book was, it was like, I spent a lot of time thinking about that. Um, no, I wasn't worried. There was more that could have gone in there, you know, and there would have been if it weren't for COVID, I was going to go to um, Guam and New Zealand and maybe even a little island way off of uh, Australia called Nauru. And these are all uh, important places for the history of our relationship with phosphorus. So no, I mean, other than the average or the normal typical doubts that you have <laughs> all the every time, <laughs> yeah, every night, middle of the night. Right. Um, no, I was, I was, you know, I, I actually had more doubts about the Great Lakes book because I was so familiar with all that material and I would look at it and I'd be, you know, kind of reconfiguring it and repurposing it and I would just think, who's going to care about this? You know, it's like most people know about this already. And uh, this, I thought, was an undercovered issue. And I still think it is. And that's why I'm confident that like this book, like every season, every summer season, there's going to be people wondering what the heck's going on with the water because it's not getting better. It's getting worse. And, um, you know, this book goes a long way to answering that question. Well, you know, comparing it to the, the previous book, which you said was built on 10 years of reporting uh, at the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. In this case, you don't have that. And I just wondered, does your 10 years of reporting and that, that in-depth level that you were afforded to go into when you were working at the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, mm -hmm. just covering the lakes so much and covering the environment and the health of the lakes, does that exist today, that opportunity? No, no, I don't think so. Not, not at a daily newspaper, you know, maybe at some independently funded journalistic outfit. But no, I, I got really lucky that I had the, um, I was at the Journal Sentinel at the time where they had the budget and then they had great editors with a vision for, you know, how we could distinguish ourselves from TV and, you know, other mediums and other papers. That was a big argument to get that Great Lakes job because I started out as a features writer and uh, I went to lunch with the editor and I was saying, you know, we should maybe think about, because I kept writing stories about the Great Lakes, I said, we should maybe think about making this a beat because what, what happens here in Milwaukee matters in Duluth and Detroit and Toronto. It matters all across the northern half, eastern, northern and eastern half of the United States. And he was, he was on board with that. So it wasn't long before I started, you know, being referred to as the Great Lakes reporter. When you think of what everything that came out of that, both all of the stories you did, all the reporting you did, so much of that reporting that informed our decisions here in Door County even, how it trickled up here. And as a reporter myself, working up here, piggybacking off of so much of the work you were doing, and you think of the impact that has, and it makes you wonder what isn't being done right now because those positions don't exist. Yeah, I know, I know. And you know, I actually maybe don't even know that much because I'm not out there <clears throat> every morning making phone calls, badgering guys like Mark, who was very helpful in the Great Lakes book and the reporting that I did at the Journal Sentinel that led up to that. But yeah, you know, you need, you don't just, great stories and even beats don't just drop onto your lap. They come from having years of exposure and, and understanding, you know, the nuances of the issue and why it matters to people and then figuring out how to convince them that it matters. 
And I don't know where this is going. I mean, I'm, something will fill it. I don't know if it'll fill it to the same extent or maybe it'll do more. You know, I'm thinking just these younger journalists coming out, they're just like one person crews. They do everything. They report, mm -hmm. they're videoing and they're distributing it themselves. You know, all the, the, I'm not really comfortable at all with the social media stuff. I, I'm still from the mindset that, you know, my job is to write it and then the circulation department's job is to put it in trucks and drive it around town and <laughs> drop, <laughs> drop information on doorsteps. And so I'm a little bit of a aged out person in that respect, aged out <laughs> journalist. So the first uh, section of the book was the race for phosphorus. Can you explain or, or share some of those races? What, what do you mean by a race for phosphorus? Sure, so, so yeah, you know, and, and this was a kind of a hard thing in the book to, to flip to like, okay, I'm talking about phosphorus as this weird thing that was discovered in a weird way and did this horrible damage, but what else about it? And, and the real interesting thing in this book, and in my opinion, about phosphorus is that it's in every living cell on the planet. There, the life wouldn't exist without phosphorus. Isaac Asimov referred to it as life's bottleneck. He's like, that's once we, once we run out of that, there's nothing. Um, so back in the 1800s, maybe 100 years after, early 1800s, maybe 100 years after uh, phosphorus was discovered, the English were really, really pioneering uh, fertilizer because, you know, it's a island nation and it was the middle of the Little Ice Age and, you know, famine was ever a threat. So they were really desperate to use whatever they could to try to get things to grow and they just experimented and tried everything from cloth to blood to um, all forms of manure, animal, human, whatever. Uh, and bones, and they, they, they struck on bones because somewhere in southern England there was a bone fa or a knife factory and they used the bone shavings and in, that, in those soils, those bo bone shavings worked really well. Nobody knew why. Well, the chemists started getting involved and they realized that it was the acidity of the soil was unleashing, unleashing the fertilizing properties of these bones. And it wasn't until maybe the 1830s that they realized what those fertilizing properties were, specifically mostly phosphorus, nitrogen, and potassium, the three main uh, ingredients of modern fertilizer. They didn't care in the 1810s what was in them. They just wanted bones. So here's another story that got me interested in wanting to do the book. They, they started craving bones to the point that they went over to Waterloo, the British, like seven years after the battle. Like 40,000 people died in 10 hours at, at Waterloo. I think it was in 1815. And um, by the 1820s, there were no bones on the battlefield because the British had gone over and plundered it and uh, built these bone crushing mills and were raising their turnips and wheat and <laughs> whatnot on, on not only the, you know, the remains of their enemy combatants, but of their sons as well. And so they started raiding bones and cemeteries all over Europe, mostly battlefields. And, and eventually those bones played out. And you know, now you have more people on the planet, more people in England because you've had success. It's kind of like you know, a high stakes, you can't fail, you're just climbing up a ladder. We've got more people, we need more <coughs> fertilizer. So that, that sent, uh, sent the agriculturists hunting again and that brought them to the Guano Islands of the South Pacific, uh, where the indigenous people for hundreds, if not thousands of years, had cherished these, these islands, these mounds, these mountains of bird poop. And there was so much bird poop there because of the Humboldt current is nutrient rich, rich with phosphorus and everything that grows on it. And that includes fish and fish grow on the birds, the fish eat the birds. I mean, the birds eat the fish. <laughs> Somebody's listening. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the birds eat the fish, and the fish, you know, have to have to nest and defecate, and it never rains. It never rains off of this uh, this area off of Peru. So at that time, the Humboldt, Alexander von Humboldt, uh, brought back a sample on his uh, on his uh, voyage to the New World. In the, like it was around 1806 or 1810. I can't remember the dates, and it doesn't really matter that much. But he brought back a bunch of this stinking mess. And literally the crew was mad at him for doing it. And the chemists analyzed it and, uh, 
and the agriculturists t tinkered with it and they were like, wow, this is, this is gold. And so that started the second phase from bones to stones, which is literally, I think, the name of a chapter in the book in the section that is the race for phosphorus. So they made the jump from, from bones, we went from bones to stones to bird poop. And they thought that there was so much of this stuff. And this is a, a recurring story with this book and with this element um, that we'd never run out of it. And this was, we, the trade started in the 1830s and the islands were played out essentially in the 1870s or 1880s, which sent us on the hunt again. And eventually geologists and chemists and agriculturists all got together and started honing in on these sedimentary rock deposits, which are really just the remains of dead sea life raining down on the ocean floor. And then just over eons, just compacting and turning into rock and through seismic forces, it gets heaved into a mineable area of the earth's surface or very close to it, the, the ocean surface or very close to it. And we mine it. And that's what we're living on right now. And once again, it's not a big surprise, we're starting to run low on it. The United States primary deposit is down in Florida and they calculate that we have three or four decades left of these very phosphorus rich rocks, at which point there are some smaller uh, deposits, reserves around the country, but we'll be going to other countries with our hat out. And you know, you think about energy security and how important that is, but there are workarounds to, you know, oil and there's zero workarounds to phosphorus. 80%, 70 to 80% of the phosphorus reserves left on the planet are in Morocco and Western Sahara. And they may not be as interested in getting food on our tables as we are at some point. So it's, yeah, it's interesting. Go ahead. Oh, I, go that's ahead, a long answer. Ahead. You're doing a great job. I could write a book about this. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me see. You know, what, what, out of that section, uh, you know, you talk about how the phosphorus circle of life has been broken. Whatever. Yeah. Can you sort of uh, expound on that yeah. a little bit? So the original, the original atoms of phosphorus. And I use the word phosphorus when we're talking about it in a fertilizer context. It's actually phosphate, which is molecule with oxygen atoms, but nobody cares about that except for about three or four people who badger me all the time on the internet or <laughs> emails. Um, but yeah, the original, the original source of phosphorus came out of igneous rocks, not sedimentary rocks, which are you know, the result of dead life. This, these were just cold, hard rocks that you know, appeared after the earth cooled and they leached into the, into the world and eventually part of the living world. And those, that phosphorus was used over and over and over again. It's just, it's the circle of life. And a simple way to describe it would be a classic uh, family farm before they all got so big when cows were out in pastures. And, you know, I think the rule of thumb is like a cow needs an acre. One cow needs an acre. And, you know, things vary depending on soil and climate, but... Just think of that, one cow, one acre, and that cow can live off of that. It eats the grass, it poops, that grows the grass, it eats the grass, it poops, and on and on and on and on and on and on. And uh, that wasn't good enough for us once we started having more and more people on the planet. And so we broke that circle of life by introducing chemical fertilizer and phosphorus fertilizer uh, derived you know, from from bones and then rocks, and and, uh, and we've really changed the like the way we look at life now. It used to be we would cherish like these manure lagoons that, that are you know many people see them as a nightmare. If you think about what the British would in the 1800s, they'd look at those and they wouldn't see yuck; they'd see yum. <laughs> you know, <laughs> there's a lot of food in there to be had, and so yeah, too often now. We just look at it as like a front end problem. We've just got to get fertilizer on the fields and get our crops to market. And we don't look at the back end consequences. And that can be seen in toxic green algae, which isn't such a big problem up here right now, but it's, it's everywhere. I mean, it's on Lake Superior. I drove up here today. I was just showing you guys the picture right before we came down the stairs. I came up Highway 57 from Milwaukee and stopped uh, in De Pere on the river across from St. Norbert College at this boat ramp that I used to play at when I was a kid. And 
it was greener than a golf course. And this guy was winterizing his boat, which I don't know what that entails, but he was just zipping back and forth. And he came in and asked me what I was looking at. And I said, just this goop. And he said, yeah, you know, this is making me cough. And I'm like, well, it's, it's actually really toxic. And he's, he wasn't that old of a person. He's like, well, I'm a heart transplant survivor. <laughs> it's like, oh, I'm not a doctor, but you might want to have somebody else winterize the boat next, <laughs> <laughs> next winter. <laughs> So, yeah, but that's, that's, that's the really, that is the essence of this book. It's the idea of the circle of life broken. We took a circle and turned it into a straight line. And today that line runs from mines in Florida or in Ukraine or in, in Morocco uh, to fertilizer factory, to crops, to our waters. Because we're putting more fertilizer we have forever been putting more fertilizer than we need because the rationale, it's just like when you're making soup, if a little of that's good, let's do a lot. And there are reasons, you know, if rain comes and then your, your, your store-bought chemical fertilizer washes off before the crops start to grow, you, you need to make sure that you have enough even if things go bad. From a, from a production perspective, but from an uh, environmental and sustainability perspective, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of phosphorus already in the soil left over from years and years. And, you know, we've gotten better about the chemical fertilizer. We're starting to use it, I think, more wisely. Not just because we're worried about the environment, because we're worried about running out of it. But manure is a whole different deal. I mean, we're, we're just, there's tons of phosphorus in, in manure. And too often we're just putting it on fields whether they need it or not because we're not trying to fertilize them. We're trying to get rid of the manure because... It's, you know, it's, it's like milk. It comes every day and it's got to go somewhere. And, and too often it's on our fields and if there's too much of it, it ends up in our water and then we end up with water that you can't swim or drink, which is a shame. Right. So one little quote in the book that uh, struck home with me is that phosphorus deposits that sustain the world's agriculture system do not regenerate on a human time scale. So it's yeah. Limited, you know, yeah, it's, yeah, that's the thing. You know, you th I was just saying, well, it never goes away. And you could be sitting here thinking, well, then when it goes to the water, we can go into the water to get it, like the sediments of Lake Erie or Lower Green Bay or something. And at some point, maybe that's what it's, it's going to come to that. But there's big habitat issues if you're going to start scooping out the western basin of Lake Erie. But also, I don't know the concentration of it. This, this stuff concentrated in these sedimentary rocks, it, it, it took it took millions or hundreds of millions or billions of years for, for these deposits to accrue. And we've only been gnawing on them for like 120, 125 years. You know, the, the prediction for like overall uh, reserves left on the planet, this woman back in like 2010 from Australia wrote a very popular and disturbing paper saying that we had 80 or 90 years left on a on a planetary scale of these deposits. And then it's every person for themselves. And, uh, you know, that's, that's been um, contested hotly by the uh, fertilizer industry. But even the most optimistic fertilizer people say three or 400 years. Well, that, that's only 1669 or so. So we have a very limited history with, with using this stuff. And um, like I said, again, we're kind of a house of cards with these eight, nine billion some may, someday maybe 10 billion people on the planet, we got to keep making food and that means mining phosphorus, but there's only so much phosphorus rocks that we can mine. I have a 16 month old, can you cheer me up? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. No. <laughs> no, I mean, there, it really comes down to, in my mind, and I'm not an engineer or a scientist, but it's, it's just stirring that ethic of, of reuse of the circular, the circular nature of phosphorus. And, you know, it's never going to be as simple as a cow pooping on a pasture again, but we can engineer on, at scale, big scale. You know, there was a story coming out of um, the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, I think it was last summer, or I can't, it was fairly recently, but there was a farm somewhere in the eastern part of the state that was now making uh, about as much money off its manure as it is off its milk because they, they installed an anaerobic digester and were selling the methane because of California renewable alternative fuel standard policies. People want that. They want, they want to buy you know, that gas because that gives them credits. 
And so this is kind of encouraging that they're doing this, but it's just the first step. The next step would be um, getting the nitrogen and the phosphorus out of it. And, and there's technologies to do that. Right now, the rule of thumb is if, if you're a farmer, you don't want to, you can't afford to move your manure more than 10 miles from the cow that produces it. So that keeps the manure in the watershed. But if you were to, you know, start extracting it, pelletizing it, it can be every bit as pure as anything coming from, you know, a chemical factory. And then you, now you can move it to where it's needed, to watersheds where they're deficient and save the water along the way. So it isn't, you know, it's, it, it's hard landings and soft landings. And we have an opportunity to start trying to plan for a soft landing. And, you know, we don't have tons of time, but maybe your 16 or 16 month old can... Uh, <laughs> You'll fix it. Figure, figure this one out. Right. But um, I have my doubts right now. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> no, I mean, there's the, any big environmental issue can kind of get you, you know, a little despondent. But you know, we just got to. All we can do is the best we can, um, or we, the best we can do. <laughs> I don't. We can do more, is what I'm trying to say. And, and it starts with education, and that starts with like reading a book. That, that has a green cover. Wait, which book would you read first? Yeah. When, it, so, Dan, when you, when you start a project like this, are you thinking of it in terms of, I'm in search of the solution, or are you thinking, I'm going to tell this story? And then I, I say that in the sense that like sometimes you're just telling the story and let people figure it from there. Yeah, you, no, that's a, good, that's a good question, and it's a question from a journalist. Because, yeah, part of me is like, when I worked at the Journal Sentinel, I would write these stories, and people would contact me and say, who should I write, and, you know, what can I do about this? And, you know, it's part of our ethic to just say, that's, that's on you. You know, I, I don't want to say support Alliance for the Great Lakes as a, as a newspaper reporter, because I can't take that role. Um, so, so there's that. But I also think... You know, there's, I talk in this book in the last chapter, I go back to Hamburg. So, you know, I hope this doesn't interrupt the flow of your questioning, Mark. Hey, but You could always get ahead of me. That's okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so, so phosphorus is discovered in Hamburg. Hamburg's burned to the ground in 1943. Germany now, they have no domestic supply of phosphorus. So to, to get one and to uh, do better by their waters, to, to keep their waters cleaner, they're mandating uh, as much as you, you can never get to 100% of anything, but 100% as, as close as you can to 100% phosphorus removal uh, from the, the sewage treatment plants, which humans produce a lot of phosphorus, a lot of phosphorus. And we take some of it out with our technology today, but not a lot of it. And, and the Germans are now taking a lot of it out in Hamburg. They just opened up uh, just this year a wastewater treatment plant on the banks of the Elbe River. That is that is like I don't want to put a number on it, but it's above 99%. They're stripping out, and that is going to be fertilizer that they can use to grow their food. So there are things, and we, we humans are a big part, but but uh, livestock is huge. It's been estimated that if we got really smart about harvesting that phosphorus from from manure, that that could provide about 50% of our annual manure or phosphorus needs. So that that, that will preserve the rock deposits that we have around the world. So it's not doom and gloom, but the path we're on is kind of gloomy. We've got to go on a different path at some point. So moving on, say, to the middle section of the book where it's <laughs> <laughs> to the, cost of, uh, the cost of phosphorus. You know, how has the way phosphorus is being used to improve produ production also been a cost or a burden to society? Okay, yeah, I was saying, so we were looking at it as a front-end issue. We've got to find the stuff and we've got to feed ourselves, but I don't know how many people here have been in areas uh, on lakes that have a heavy infestation, but it's, it's a nightmare. I mean, it, the stuff kills dogs. It's in Brazil, so, so when I say the stuff, it's, it's, a, it's cyanobacteria, also known as blue-green algae, and there's a whole array of species, but the one that I really focus on because it's, the most problematic is microcystis. And that's that stuff that looks like green paint on the water surface. And uh, it produces a, uh, a toxin called, the, the, the cyanobacteria is called microcystis and the toxin it produces is called microcystin. And microcystin is, is really bad stuff. 
uh, it got into the water supply in Lake Erie or in Toledo on the western end of Lake Erie in 2014 and shut down drinking water for over a half a million people for several days. And you couldn't just boil the water like a bacteria problem because this would only concentrate the toxin. So th there's like a half a million people, babies included, who didn't have any water. They had to bring in the National Guard with water tankers and pallets of baby formula. And this is a city on the shore of the world's largest freshwater system. So the environmental consequences, they're not just environment, I mean, they're, they're human health and their economic consequences. And it's not, it's not uh, you know, just contained on Lake Erie. It's, I mentioned earlier, they're finding it up on Lake Superior now. And you know, I spent a fair amount of time in this book down in Florida, not just following what happened to this guy who jumped in the canal, but talking to people who live in uh, the coastal cities of Stewart, Florida on the Atlantic and um, Fort Myers on the Gulf. And so what happens, Lake Okeechobee is in the middle of the state and the middle of the state is farm country. And Lake Okeechobee is huge. It's, it's like 30 miles across and it's round, but it's only about nine feet deep and it's really warm, naturally productive, but made way more so by all the uh, agricultural and human wastes making their way down to the lake. The problem is the lake is contained by this dike that has a history of fail failing and it's, it's failed twice and it's killed in 1926, 1924 and 1926, I believe, and it killed several thousand people. And now it would be tens of thousands of people because of all the people in Florida. So when the water starts getting too high in Lake Okeechobee, they open up the gates and they send this, I say water with an asterisk because it's, it's carrying a lot of this microcystin in it. And it, it goes down to these communities that have nothing to do directly with, with what's going on in the middle of the state, except for they eat hamburgers and drink milk and do all the things that dairy farmers do for us, which is much appreciated. Um, but when there are problems to the current system and, and these people are suffering it, and it really interested me that you'd have a room full of people and they weren't predictable environmentalists. It wasn't like they were worried about some charismatic megafauna up in the Arctic Circle, you know, polar bears, let's save the polar bears. They're like, no, let's, let's save my property <laughs> value. Let's save my kid from having to go to the doctor again. I talked to this one commercial fisherman who had been eating Tums for like four days and he had all these ulcers and it was traced back to his exposure. You don't even have to go into the water to be exposed. It can aerosolize and now I'm going to like freak you out <laughs> because I, I, I approach this very cautiously in the book because there is no causation established, but there is a correlation between people who live by these heavily infested waters and neurodegenerative diseases like ALS. And there's a lot of research going on about that right now. And it's, it's scary. The connection is, is drawn out in the book and it, it has to do with a certain protein, but the protein that everybody's worried about, they, they like did an autopsy on like 12 dolphins that washed ashore and they all had, uh, they all had this protein in their brain and people are like, the main study I relied on was a guy from uh, Dartmouth who's been on this for like 15 years. So I, I, I discuss it as speculative, but worthy of, worthy of speculating. So yeah, it's, there are back end problems that alone are enough to, to, you know, I would argue compel us to change the way the system works today. But when you couple that with the front end concerns, like we've got to feed ourselves, um, this is why phosphorus is, is so critical, so important. Yeah. Yeah. So um, why are the corn, Iowa cornfields so important to the Gulf of Mexico? Okay, so we're talking about potential solutions or optimistic paths forward. That's a great question. 40%, this is probably not a surprise to a lot of people in the room, but 40% of the corn we grow goes to ethanol. And so th that not only takes a lot of energy and a lot of acreage and a lot of habitat out of production, but otherwise, you know, be used by birds and other things. Um, it, it, it takes a lot of phosphorus. And, you know, anybody who isn't a Iowa or a corn farmer or you know, in the business of, of refining corn into dubious ethanol, knows that ethanol isn't a great idea, but it still uh, persists because 
Iowa. I mean, the Democrats have changed things up, but Iowa is at the front of the primary calendar. And if you want to be um, president of the United States, you basically have to do well in Iowa. And to do well in Iowa, you have to pledge allegiance to ethanol. And so that's one thing. I, I really kind of, if, if, if I have two like aggressive points in the book, it's, I'm not, it's not prescriptive, it's not saying we need to do this or that, but I would say two things. One, we gotta rethink ethanol. And two, we gotta revisit the agriculture exemption from the Clean Water Act. Because when we got the Clean Water Act in 1972, 50 years ago, we farmed very differently. The scale of farms have gotten so huge now that in regulatory parlance, farmers got a pass because they were considered non-point source polluters as opposed to smokestacks and pipes. And the rationale was, you know, the, the source isn't, is phosphorus isn't that, or pollute, just call it pollution, phosphorus and other things, isn't that great. And it's also too hard to get our hands on. 50 years down the road, we have 8,000, 10,000, had a cattle dairies and they are by definition a point source of pollution uh, you just go to those lagoons and there's a point source of pollution and so they need to be regulated better because what's happening now is you know manifestly not working it's, you know it's 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 too many water bodies are, are just becoming <laughs> trashed and, and useless and we shouldn't be on a collision course between fresh water safe water and food, we need both, we, but we can have both, but we're right now on a, on a bad path. One of, the, one of the scenes in the book, I go to Lake Mendota at the University of Wisconsin campus, and you know that lake, on that lake is the UW's Center for Limnology, which is the study of freshwater sciences, and it's like the oldest and best in the country. So we've got some of the best limnologists on the planet, and we also have some of the best soil scientists on the planet. And I, I look at, you know, Lake Mendota as, you know, uh, prime example, number one. Like, if we can't figure this out here where we have, we have all the tools. And, and, you know, people love that lake. And, you know, they love ice cream at the student union. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that just, to me, seems to be just crying out to be the test case for let's, let's figure out how to keep the farmers in business and to keep this water swimmable. Because right now, Lake Mendota, so I, I, I did a talk there with Charlie Behrens, the uh, Wisconsin guy. At August, the last day of August this year, we were, we were down there on, on the terrace with um, a limnologist and a soil scientist and just talking about how do we go forward here. And you know, there was nobody in the water and there were a bunch of kids on, on those aluminum docks behind the union that are in seasonally. And I pointed, I'm like, you know, those kids should be in the water. I think it was two days later or a day later. There are so many kids on the dock. The it collapsed. Down. Yeah. And they said, you know, and luckily nobody, you could have been killed, you know, if you're trapped under that debris. Nobody was, but they should have been in the water anyway. They should have been in there swimming. And you know, they call it the shift, shifting baseline where just like these students arrive and they just see a lake that you can't swim in and they don't question it. And that's a tragedy. In the book, I, I do talk to a woman who's a graduate student there who grew up in Madison and she was saying it's changed in her short lifespan. And I actually, I went from, from Madison, I hopped in my car that afternoon and drove to Des Moines and went to the Iowa State Fair and, and found Joe Biden in the bathroom. I found him coming out of the bathroom and got him on the record. He supports ethanol, not surprisingly. Elizabeth Warren, same thing. But you couldn't change their mind? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was, I was lucky I didn't get thrown to the floor. <laughs> Getting that close to Joe Biden, but uh, yeah. Yeah, well, I know some of the, the things you mentioned in your book, you know, like a cow can produce 18 times the amount of fecal waste as humans, things like that. So those are big, you know, 8,000, um, head of ha cattle is a lot of people. Yeah, do the numbers and it's like a city of a, whatever, half, half right. million or something, and we don't treat it, you know? And, and in 1972, we couldn't treat it because it was just dispersed on the landscape. Now it's in these lagoons and we can, we can put it in pipes and, and it's gonna the, cost you know, something, but not swimming in a lake is, is a real cost. It's not on your ledger, but it's real. And so 
if milk costs more, and right now, I mean, I don't know if people here saw the story from July when they were running like 35,000 gallons of milk a day through Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewer District, Sewerage District, because there was a glut on the supply, in the supply. The system isn't working for the farmers right now either. And I'm not trying to demonize or vilify, they're working in the system that we set up a half century ago and you know we're rebuilding roads that we built a half century ago. We should be re rebuilding that law. Inger Johnson from, from Al Johnson's restaurant up in Sister Bay cornered me at the opening of the Northern Skies Theater a couple of years ago. And she, she had read an article and she said, you know, 50 years ago when, and I won't try to do her accent, I'm not good at it, but she said 50 years ago when Sister Bay hit a population of 500, we decided to put in a wastewater treatment plant. And if cows are producing 10 to 20 times the amount of waste as humans, why aren't we just approaching them the same way? So it really crystallizes what you were saying. Yeah, yeah, it does. And, you know, the farmers are struggling. The, the family farms are just, you know, we're on track to, I mean, there's always going to be some, but they're, they're closing so fast that by the, you know, 2050, they're going to be like a novelty, very much a no like, like there'll be a handful of them. And, you know, so they're left with the choice of going big or, or closing. And, you know, I'm agnostic as far as the size of the farm that my milk or steak comes from. I think that, you know, a lot of people knee jerk thinking that these are automatically bad. They are, they're not good right now the way they're managed, but they can be managed much better. And I think the farmers ultimately would appreciate that. I was in Madison last week at the World Dairy Expo just just for curiosity. And I wanted to go to two sessions. One was uh, rotisseries or robots. And it was people who had installed, farmers who had installed the, the carousels. You know, when they milk, you get on that wheel and the, by the time the wheel spins around, the cow's done milking and it walks off or the robots that latch on. And, you know, these guys were talking about how this was just the only choice they had because, you know, things had changed so much since their grandfathers and great grandfathers were farming. The next session across the hall, literally sequentially, like the next session was uh, mental health and dairy farming. And, you know, they're talking, to, and it's, I mean, it's serious. The farmers, their suicide rates three times the, the national average. They're, they're, they're not liking this right now either. Nobody likes the system we have right now, except for the ethanol guys and girls, gals. Right. So, yeah. Probably I, open it up for questions because yeah, Dan's got to drive back to Milwaukee tonight. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, um, with that, I guess we'll open it up for questions. So, if you have questions, uh, we will chase you down with a microphone. So, now, Dan, I've read both your books. They're amazing. Thank I you. couldn't put them down. Um, my question is. Have you done studies, have you done comparative studies of, of what's happening in the rest of the world and how they're managing their, their farms? Are they doing a better job, a worse job, a different job from what we're doing here? That was one of the reasons I wanted to go to New Zealand. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I can't say that they are, but I can't, I can't believe that they aren't because it's just so wide open right now with the way our dairies are, our, our large dairies are relatively un, <laughs> un um, regulated. But no, I can't say go to Sweden and you'll see this, but, but there are, they are, like Sweden is actually a good example. There's a town there where they're trying to just radically replumb the whole town. So the urine goes into fertilizer instead of through composting. It's kind of like a passive treatment system. This is a town of like 11,000 people or something rather than into their water. But no, you know, I, I never in my research came across, you know, the ideal place where everything's back in harmony. And, you know, we could be it if we just get on it. Let me run up here. Um, so you were at the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel for quite a number of years. And Milwaukee has at their waste treatment plant, don't they create fertilizer? Milorganite, yeah. Is that, a, is that process that they use, uh, I, want, I don't want to say scale up, but can you scale it down to, so a farmer could do that? Um, 
Well, I think, I, I don't know about that technology, but, but what's going on with, with the, the malorganite using the, the sludge, if you, you know, it's not, it's not sewage, it's, it's the product of what, you know, the treatment system makes, but it's not, it's not all good because it, it contains a lot of stuff that you don't want to put on a food crop. I think it's primarily, or legally, it's only supposed to be used for, for like turf and stuff. But you can further treat it. That's what the Germans are doing. That's, you know, they're, they're, they're taking that sludge, they're incinerating it, and then they're soaking it in acid, which is pulling out the phosphoric acid, which is the stuff that comes out of the ground once it's refined. Phosphoric acid is how it's often commonly sold. So the technology is out there. Melorganite is just a step along the way. And, you know, it, it, I'm not going to disparage the melorganite because it's a good use of a resource, but it's not, it's not what you want to be raising your app potatoes and tomatoes on. I guess I'll kind of piggyback on that because I think the malorgolite I've heard is FAVSAs. Do we have to worry about that in malorgolite? There's more, more, yeah, I mean, the better we get at measuring, the more we find stuff that we don't so want So it to. kind of piggybacks on this. When we're going to get the phosphorus out of, be it the cow manure or human matter, how do we have to address our pharmaceutical use in that? I think we can get, we can get beyond the pharmaceuticals and the treatment that they're doing in, in Germany, but I, I don't know. And again, you know, I, I'm, I'm with this book, I say it, I think we're right out of the bat. Like, I'm not here to, to say this is what we need to do, except for ethanol and maybe the Clean Water Act. <laughs> um, <laughs> But it's, and it's, you know, it's not written for scientists. You know, I, I get people, they get, they have problems with me referring to algae blooms as algae blooms instead of algal blooms. But I wrote it just for regular people. So it didn't sound like it was inaccessible. But that's all I have for that answer. Other questions? Well, this is more of a comment. Um, for those of you that live here in the city of Sturgeon Bay, we have a wonderful community park, Sunset Park. It has a little lake on it, also called, known as Bradley Lake. That well, I live right across the street from there. Um, this summer, we had an algal bloom. Supposedly, maybe blue-green algae. Uh, the city posted signs. Woohoo! Good for them. Um, and I saw people with their kids fishing, saw people uh, wading in the water, and I'm just going, and they're right next to the signs, right? Uh, we have a problem. There's, I think, a latent phosphorus load there. Mm -hmm. uh, so for those of you that live in the city of Sturgeon Bay, please contact your council members to uh, kick the city to move faster so that we don't have to deal with this yeah, there next was a, summer. There was a kid in Dane County like around 2007, I'm <coughs> thinking, who went swimming in a golf course pond and um, he died. And there, the coroner, for a while they said, yeah, it's cyanobacteria. And then they kind of, they, it's now indeterminate, but it, it's not a safe place for any people, any person or pet to be at all. It's, yeah. Okay. Got one more. Oh, I, okay. I, I have a comment uh, just that, and I wanted to ask the question. I think you mentioned having uh, bones were used and ground up mm -hmm. for, for use. Well, I can attest to that, actually, because I used to work for the Arco Chemical Company on the Mississippi River, uh -huh. and I had the dubious honor of helping them clean their, uh, their chemistry set. Their chemistry set was a couple of city blocks in size and about 400 feet tall, and uh, one of the plants was called the bone meal plant, and they had a room about this size from floor to ceiling full of bone meal, Mm -hmm. and, and they would run bones from a rendering plant. I don't know what they got it from. Uh, I, uh, probably uh, the, the local farm, farming community uh, factories that, that would, would make meat. And uh, anyway, they would take the bones, 
run them through this ball mill. A ball mill is a big round tub that's it's like uh, like polishing. Well, anyway, it's it goes round and round, big big um, steel balls grinding the bones as they go through, and a wind is uh, a current of wind air is pulled through, and it's just heavy, very heavy dust. The only thing that comes out the other end is bone dust. And if yeah. you go into this room and settle, and then they, they would take it in the, as, as they used the bone meal, they would add it to acid. <clears throat> and they called it phosphate acid. Yeah, phosphoric acid. Yeah. Phosphoric, and, the, and the phosphoric acid plus the ammonia plant plus uh, nitrogen, I'm not sure where that all came from, but it would all coagulate into little granules that we called fertilizer, and they would bag it. And uh, by the way, they would, <laughs> they would put the same, uh, the same granules in a hundred different labeled bags. It was all the same stuff, but they had different prices. You know, every every place in, in the United States had uh, uh, the same stuff, but you were paying different prices for it. <laughs> Interesting. Well, thank you very much. And. Um, your second book for me was as informative as the first one. Uh, so, so what's your next one going to be on? Uh, I don't know if there's going to be a next one. I got to just kind of figure out. I'm interested. I am interested in dairy, you know, just just the history of it and um, the future of it. But I don't I'm not saying I'm writing a book about it. I'm just kind of interested in it. Well, I can't thank you enough for coming here, at least for the Fishtails lecture series. You're the big fish that did not get away. <laughs> Thank you. So thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you all for coming. Just some quick announcements. Actually, in two weeks, there's another um, session put on by the Door County Environmental Council about the new book that's come out, Paper Valley, and it, it talks about the PCB cleanup of the Fox River. You may want to catch that. Uh, my wife's holding it up right there. Um, um, I see Mike Grimm here. He's going to be on a panel discussion with me. But the authors of those book will will talk about what that process is like. It's sort of you know, like the Clean Water Act working on a on, on contaminants, and hopefully we can ha have some system that can also help out with the the phosphorus issue. Uh, the <clears throat> Uh, Crossroads has a monthly book club, and this month it's actually on uh, Dan's book, The Devil's Element. So on the fourth Wednesday of this month, if you've been reading it, hadn't been involved with this book club, come on over and, and join the discussion, uh, and it'll just broaden the, the diversity of opinion and so on. The Fishtails Lecture Series starts on January 18th, um, um, so look for those announcements. And with that, I think we may give Dan a, a moment to... Uh, catch up, but we have a table up here um, where you'll sign some books, right? Yeah, yeah, I gotta, I gotta get on the road, but I'm happy to sign some books. Okay, yeah. so again, thank you very much for coming.